Hello and welcome to the Pole Position Podcast. It is Tuesday, May 15th, 2018, and in today's episode I'm going to be discussing, talking about, and reviewing the Spanish Grand Prix. All right, so before we get into this week's Spanish Grand Prix, uh, let's go over a few news stories. So the first story this week, the Miami City Commission, City Commission of Miami, voted unanimously to further progress with plans to bring a race to the city of Miami, a street course. Um, According to this CNN International article, the... Managing Director of Commercial Operations for F1, Sean Branches, revealed that they had received, quote, preliminary approval. So it's not set in stone quite yet, um, but it looks like this article says further discussion will now take place between the owners, FIA, and Miami City authorities, with an inaugural Miami Grand Prix potentially taking place in October 2019. So they... Like I say, it's not set in stone, but it is certainly moving forward uh, to the next step, and maybe it'll happen as early as next season, so that certainly is exciting. Uh, This article also mentions, though, that apparently Lewis Hamilton is not happy with the design of the track. I kind of talked about the design of the track on last week's episode, or well, last race's episode. Um, I don't know. Overall, I personally think it looks like it's a pretty cool design it's definitely unique um, with those two long straightaways over the bridge Um, but anyway Lewis Hamilton definitely disagrees now Lewis Hamilton did say that his dream track would be in Miami according to this article that's what he told CNN I don't know if it was earlier in the year or let's see yeah, he told he told CNN in April that Miami would be the location of his dream circuit. But, this article says, um, Lewis Hamilton lamented the lack of driver consultation in the plans, pointing out golfers are regularly asked input on courses. So yeah, Lewis Hamilton is not happy that um, it seems, at least with the proposed circuit, again, nothing is final quite yet, But with the proposed circuit, uh, he's upset that the city of Miami did not consult any Formula One drivers. Hamilton said, uh, quoting from the article here, which, by the way, I am linking the article down in the show notes. Um, It actually has a really interesting video that they did, I assume, back in April that they... Uh, referenced to earlier when he when Lewis Hamilton said he would like a track in Miami, uh, that was part of a video that they did where they talked about um, they they talked to it looks like a lot of drivers about where their favorite tr- or well where they would like to see a new track and then they asked the drivers to sketch out a track. So that's very interesting. That's um, I- embedded into the article, so that will be linked in the in with the article as well if you want to check that out. But uh, anyway, Lewis Hamilton says, and I quote, I don't get why, for example, in golf, you get all the great golfers who design golf courses, and then you've not got any of the top racing drivers ever in history who have ever designed a racetrack. Not that we're designers or anything, but we've not been asked for our input or anything like that. Um, You know, he certainly does make a, a good point. I certainly wouldn't be against any driver, you know, helping design a track. Um, However, having said that, um, I don't know how much driver input will help with this particular course because it's not like Miami is wanting to clear some land and build a road course, uh, you know, that's Formula One professional grade from scratch. They're actually using existing roads because Miami... some of the, certainly the appeal of this race and what Miami wants is a city circuit. So obviously you have to use existing roads. So it's not so much designing a track from scratch. It's more finding roads that are compatible with the cars and would make for an interesting race. 
but also you have to find a balance because the the roads are existing so it's not it's not like you can just go crazy with it and design something from scratch and then build it that's not what they want to do so it's more of a puzzle almost where we need to find good and interesting roads and a and then plot a course through all these already existing streets but certainly i'm sure drivers could have some major input on what the cars can and can't do and what would make for interesting um, and entertaining races um, so yeah i'm certainly not against that i think lewis makes a good point um, certainly should consult maybe some of the top drivers from past and present to see what they have to say about the current course and if any revisions could be made or if anything could make it better or if they want just scrap that whole damn thing and um find somewhere else to put it um but yeah he makes a good point but i don't know how applicable it would be in miami to be honest and he does even kind of mention that from the article he says uh, miami is a super cool place and i was very very excited to hear about it and then i saw the layout so having said what i've said um he certainly knows what he's talking about uh so you know he knows what he most likely knows what would make a good race and what wouldn't the city commission of miami may not necessarily know what makes a good race they just want you know the only i mean let's face it the only thing miami commission cares about is publicity for miami and they want it to go by all their exciting tourist attractions and oh look at all the shit we have and they're you know they want it to go by their landmarks to drive tourism and you know just you know make miami look good that's that is the city commission's motive behind this whereas with a race car driver, their their motive would be just pure racing, pure enjoyment of race and motorsport. So, um, yeah, they they sure they certainly should consult drivers about it. Anyway, moving on, more continuation of last week's stories. Let's talk a little bit more about F1 TV. Um, this was my first real race with it. It was my first, um, I, I actually didn't want to watch, I didn't watch it live, so I don't want to call it, um, it was my first live viewing experience. They've had problems with that that I'll address in just a moment, but it was my first, it was my first time actually using it to watch the, uh, most recent race. And while I did watch a replay version of the race, it was only like 10 or 11 hours after the race aired. So let's talk about a few of the issues that they've had and my experience with it, you know, being a couple days into using the product. I personally am still pretty happy with the product, um, though I have to say it is, my patience with it is a little bit thinner than it was last episode. Um, One thing that they have fixed since last episode, at least for me, is uh, the issue where if you had the commentators on the track audio wouldn't come through. That has been fixed as far as I can tell. However, a new issue that has arisen from the commentator audio track is that I don't know if anyone else has had this issue. I haven't really looked into it, but for me, it seems like audio commentary, the commentators, at least on the English channel, cut out randomly, and they can be they can cut out anywhere from like 30 seconds to 10 minutes, I think was the longest stint I had of just no commentators at all for some reason. Like the audio just goes completely silent on the commentator side. Now, the track audio is still there, so just for some inexplicable reason, um, the the commentators will just go away and um, and they, they won't be there. The only thing that you can hear is the track and the engine noises and the audience and things like actually happening at the race. So that's a bit unusual. I don't know what's going on there. I don't know if it's on purpose or not. It doesn't really seem to be as they're cutting... Uh, 
Well, it kind of does seem to be, but I don't think it is, because it seems like every time it does cut out, a sentence has finished, and every time it comes back in, a sentence is just starting. So I don't know if they are purposefully cutting some things out or not. I don't think so, but it can kind of feel that way sometimes, to be honest, because... Like I say, so far, like, the commentary has never just randomly stopped in the middle of someone's sentence. It's always been someone gets a complete thought out, and then I just don't hear anything for, like, ten minutes from the commentators. And there's just absolutely no way that the Sky Guys are not talking for ten-minute intervals at a time. Um, but then when they come back, it's, like, a new sentence or a new topic, so... I don't know, it's weird. It's almost like someone is editing out some parts of it before it goes up onto F1 TV, but I don't think that is actually happening. Just a weird coincidence. So that's something I've noticed. Um, another thing that's that's kind of unfortunate about it is that it doesn't really have any official TV apps. It's desktop only. Of course, that's something that we, we knew um, from the very beginning, like before it even came out, we knew that they were just going to roll out desktop first, and it's not that bad for me because I have an Apple TV, and the iPhone lets you beam pretty much anything to the Apple TV. So, it, overall, I mean, I can st I can still get it on TV, and it's fine. It's just a bit inconvenient to have to take those steps. Now, some issues that I haven't personally noticed, because to be honest, I haven't tried that. I haven't actually tried this yet, but um, a lot of people were experiencing, watching the, the race live, um, they were experiencing stuttering and interruptions in the live broadcast. Now, again, I've only watched the replays, so I've had absolutely no problems at all. The replays work very well, but obviously people are upset because they're paying for F1 TV Pro, you have to have the Pro tier, the $12 a month tier, to watch the live service, or the, the races live, and to have the live streaming service. So, obviously when you're paying $12 a month for something, and it's not working the way it should be, you would probably be a little upset over that. Um, but, however, they did send me an email that I got the other day, and I'm going to read it to you. Now, from what I understand, they sent this email to every F1 TV Pro subscriber. It says, Hello, thanks for recently subscribing to F1 TV Pro. As you may know, we have experienced some live playback issues during our coverage of practice and qualifying from the Spanish Grand Prix. We want to apologize for the inconvenience caused, and we're working as quickly as we can to get this resolved for you. Unfortunately, we do anticipate the problems experienced during qualifying will not be resolved in time for the race, and from what I understand, that didn't happen. They, they didn't get it resolved for the race. So, um, I'm going to skip this paragraph. It says, because of the problems you've been experiencing, we will be refunding you the equivalent of two weeks of your subscription. So, with this week, with this refund, the Grand Prix this weekend is on us. So, they certainly did do right. Um, they, they made it a bit right by giving people a refund, but obviously it, it is a bit, a bit disappointing you know, if you are wanting to watch it live. Um, I try to watch races live, but a lot of times I don't get to. Being in America, you have to get up at crazy hours of the of the morning or even sometimes the night before to watch these things. So, actually, this was the first race this season I didn't watch live. Um, but generally speaking, I, I usually just watch them on demand anyway. So, I'm I'm personally pretty happy with F1 TV. They, they do have a few kinks they need to work out. And obviously, if you are wanting to watch live, which it being a sporting event is pretty damn important to a lot of people, um, if, if you're wanting to watch it live, you may want to hold off actually on getting it. Um, just stick, or at least if you do get it, keep your cable as well. Um, if you do want to completely cut the cord, it may not be the time to do that. You may want to keep your cable just as a backup because this F1 TV, I imagine, is still... It's going to be buggy for the next couple of races at least, I would imagine. Um, but overall, again, I'm, I'm very happy with it. All right, so that's going to do it for the news this episode. I do know that I just talked about the same shit I talked about last week. But uh, to be honest with you, there's not really a whole lot going on in the world of Formula One that's not really 
um, in reference to or revolving around this Spanish Grand Prix. So that's it for just general news. Uh, let's get into the race. Spain. Um, it was a pretty boring race, if I'm being honest. Uh, that's the way I generally feel about Spain, at least the past two years in particular. Um, obviously, a few big things did happen that I'm going to talk about and discuss, but for the most part, Spain always, to me, just feels kind of like a filler race. It's like, eh, you know, that's that's basically the way it is to me. It's just a meh race. Like, I watch it, and I'll have it going and maybe fiddle on my phone or something, but it's not like generally an edge of your seat, I have to watch it from beginning to end, constantly kind of race. At least it's not for me. I'm not that big of a fan of the track, um, and it just generally ends up being a boring race to me. And for the most part this year, that it was no exception. Um, now, having said that, let's uh, get into the topics of the race and talk about a few of the things that happen. Before we really get into it, I do just want to make a side note that the um, crying Ferrari kid from last year, Thomas, um, last year Raikkonen crashed out of the race and had to retire at Spain, and whenever that happened, the feed cut to a boy all in his Ferrari garb crying his eyes out because his hero had crashed out of the race, so... Someone at Ferrari or Raikkonen, somebody in Ferrari saw the kid crying on the feed, I imagine. I don't really know. And they had him uh, come to the back in the garage and meet some of the guys in Raikkonen and get a picture and things. But um, he's back this year, and from what I understand, he did get to meet uh, Raikkonen again and go back into the garage again. So, just a cool little side note. Thomas, the Ferrari fan, got to see his hero retire from a race two years in a row. So, yeah. Uh, maybe when I go to Austin this year, I'll uh, cry if someone gets if someone crashes out, and maybe they'll let me go into the back, too. All right. Anyway, let's get into the actual race. So there are a few things I want to talk about from this week's race. Um, the first thing I think I want to talk about is is just how beastly the cars are this year. I guess this isn't a Spanish Grand Prix specific thing, but certainly was noticeable this weekend at the race. I mean, we're the lap the last time a lap record had been set was in 2008 by Kimi Raikkonen, and that record had remained for now 10 years. And then this year, the lap record gets broken multiple, multiple times. It's crazy. You would just see lap after lap after lap. Um, new, new, new lap record, new lap record, new lap record. Um, like I'm seeing right here, lap 21, a new record was set by Hamilton. Then on that same lap, a new record by Botas. Um, and then before that, I think... Hamilton had done it a few times, and then eventually, by the end of the race, uh, Ricardo just kept getting lap records, lap records, lap records, lap records. Uh, it looks like 62, uh, according to my notes here, was the lap that the actual record got written down um, as being the, the current record, because it was the last lap where anyone set one. And Ricardo crossed the line with a 118-441. I mean, we're talking... Let's see, the previous lap record by Raikkonen was a 121.67, and again, that was set in 2008. So Raikkonen set that in 08, and it held up for 10 years um, until this year, where it was broken numerous times during the Spanish Grand Prix, um, and the final... 
the final time someone broke the record, it was by over three seconds. Ricardo ended up with that 118.441, which is 3.2 seconds quicker than Raikkonen's 121.67. And, of course, Ricardo is an amazing driver, and everyone that broke the record today, or, or during the race, I should say, are good drivers, and they certainly should have some credit in how quickly they're getting the car across the line. But the car this this year is just an absolute monster. It's an absolute machine. Um, it's kind of an iteration of last year's car, which, when it was unveiled, was an absolute monster machine. So I just wanted to say, like... Before we actually talk about more of the race, that car, the car this year is an absolute monster. And, you know, with rumors of the car next year going to be like 1.5 seconds slower or whatever on average uh, per lap, I just think that it's interesting to look at, you know, just how quick of a car they have this year. It's just an absolute machine. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is Verstappen. Uh, Verstappen obviously has had kind of a rough patch, a stint of crashes and DNFs and naysayers on the Internet who are 300 pounds and type across their keyboard what they would do if they could fit their fat ass into a Formula One car. Okay, that was a bit mean. That was taking it too far, but seriously, the Internet people are ridiculous, so... Uh, all kinds of criticism towards Verstappen lately. So he 100% needed to prove himself this race. And did he? Kind of. Um, so he did end up making contact with someone. Um, so we didn't get a contact-free race from Max Verstappen this time around. He, I believe, ran into the back of Stroll. Let's see... Yeah, there was um, there's a safety car at around lap 40 because Ocon had to pull over due to some mechanical issues, and then the restart at four, lap 43, um, Verstappen starts to go, and for some reason, from what I understand, Stroll for some reason didn't start to go or something. And anyway, Verstappen ends up running into the back of Lance Stroll, and ends up. Um, getting damage on his front wing. I mean, there's a good chunk of his front wing that gets torn off. Um, and in fact, Sergio Perez later runs over uh, that piece of debris because it ends up just laying in the track um, on one of the straights. It was just in the middle of the track, and Perez goes right over Verstappen's detached front wing. But yeah, anyway, he goes in, uh, Verstappen goes into the back of Stroll and, and loses a big chunk of his front wing. So that certainly it sounds bad and is kind of bad. You don't want to make contact in such a fragile car. I mean, these things, it's like you feel like sometimes if someone blows too hard in the direction, the car will break. Um, so obviously it looked really bad, but Verstappen was actually told over the radio that structurally the wing is fine, so if he is okay with the balance, it is okay to finish the race with. So, um, even with that front wing damage, Verstappen stays out, doesn't go into pit or anything or replace the front wing, and actually keeps the pace. Vettel is behind him pushing him, trying to pass so that Vettel can get a podium because Verstappen is in third and actually keeps Vettel at bay and Verstappen ends up finishing third, uh, ends up getting a podium. So it certainly is a good day for Verstappen. It's something that needed to happen. He definitely needed to have good results. Uh, this was good timing on his part. I don't know, maybe surely some of it was a little bit of luck, but... He's a damn good race car driver. He ended up finishing third. And like I say, it's needed to shut them naysayers on the internet and honestly in motorsport um, journalism because there are a few naysayers just in journalism talking bad about him. But, um, I mean, you can't talk bad about a third place finish with a broken front wing. Now, what you can talk bad about is, that's what I was alluding to earlier, is it's kind of a um, double-edged sword. It's, it's um, yes, you finished with a broken 
front wing and you manage to keep the pace with, you know, kind of a messed up car, but it is you're doing, uh, you are the one that ran into Stroll. And now I know some people are saying that Stroll didn't get going in time, but at the end of the day, the fact of the matter is, is if you run into someone from behind, that is your fault. I mean, just end of story, that's your fault. Um, so, again, there's there's two sides to the story. Yes, he did great, on uh, considering that he had a broken front wing. But at the same time, Verstappen really does, and this is coming from a huge Verstappen defender and fan, Verstappen needs to stop making contact with other, with other cars. So, obviously that's not great that he made contact, but he did, you know, make up for it by getting a podium for Red Bull. So, um, going a bit out of order here chronologically, let's go back to lap one, the first lap. Um, Vettel gets a very nice start. He goes from, I believe he was, let's see, he was third. Um, so he was starting third on the grid, and he gets a very good start and just zooms by Botas, who's in second, and is right on the rear end of Hamilton by turn one, or not too far after turn one. Um, very good start from Vettel. But then at turn two or three, Romain Grosjean of Haas um, having another incident. He's had a kind of a rash of incidences lately. Um, he spins, spins his car. It goes completely around. He ends up going backwards across the track, kind of, um, I mean, perpendicular to the other cars almost. And, um... Nico Hulkenberg ends up, or well, he actually, uh, as as Grosjean is going back, he ends up clipping Nico Hulkenberg, and then Gasly, who's coming, obviously, with the rest of the pack, has nowhere to go as well, and actually runs into Grosjean, and all three end up being out of the race. Uh, I wanted to talk about Romain Grosjean. He's kind of had a, like I said, a, a rash of incidences lately. In one of the free practices this week, this race weekend, he had an issue where he ended up getting stuck in the gravel. Um, he spun out and ended up getting stuck in the gravel. And then last race at Azerbaijan, he ends up, you know, and I give him the benefit of the doubt of this one. Um, you know, it's not always easy to control these cars, but uh, he ended up crashing, spinning the wheels too hard and crashing into the wall under a safety car last week at Azerbaijan. I just wanted to kind of briefly touch on Romain Grosjean's recent incidents. Um, it certainly is unfortunate for him, and, and you know, it, it. he's a good race car driver, but he's just had a, just a string of bad luck and I mean and obviously it's not all luck I mean there is some blame that you'd have to put on him but you know it, it really is just an unfortunate situation for Romain Grosjean and I just wanted to kind of touch on that because I do like him you know I don't really have a point to make in all this um, other than I feel really bad for him you know and, it, and it's just really unfortunate um, anyway, uh, moving on, he's kind of a good segue uh, to talk about the next topic. Uh, the cars this year are just absolutely absurd. Um, yes, they're super fast and badass, like I was mentioning earlier, but it just, I have noticed such a, I've noticed a dramatic increase in kind of squirreliness, for lack of a better term. The rear end is very happy on these cars. Obviously, in Formula 1, the rear end is, has always been happy in the cars, but they're, it's just, I mean, these, they're losing, they're on like the verge of losing control, and you can like see it this year so much clearer than you've been able to see in any other year. Sometimes it looks really cool, like when Ricardo drifted out um, of the pits that time in China after he had been in the pits um, all qualifying, and he drifted out to get his one lap in before Q1 ended in China. 
Um, other times, it looks like Romain Grosjean going into the wall at Azerbaijan. It's just... It's crazy, though. It seems like every single turn this year, the drivers are struggling to keep the car from going off into the gravel, um, which certainly is great. I, I like more powerful cars and cars that are more squirrely. It makes for an interesting race, makes for a more challenging race for the drivers, but it's crazy. I just kind of wanted to touch on the way I've I've noticed... Uh, the cars behaving a little more aggressive in the rear. All right, so that's pretty much the main things that I wanted to talk about and discuss. Um, I will be- very briefly just um, mention uh, Vettel's pit stop. A lot of people are talking about how it was a mistake for him to go into the pits and pit twice. Everyone else was on a one-stop strategy, and for some reason, Ferrari was on a two-stop strategy with Vettel. Um, you know, I really don't have a lot to say about this. I don't think it's that big of a deal, to be honest. Um, and really, anything that I would say, people have already said. It's not really just... It's really not anything I care about. But uh, Vettel goes in and he... Get, he's already on mediums, I believe, and he like pits onto another fresh set of mediums. So he doesn't change compounds or anything. He just goes in to get fresh tires, and I guess they hoped that that would give them the advantage in the second half of the race. Um, It didn't. Um, Everyone else had only pitted once, and that pit ended up really costing him. So I don't really care. Um, Again, I have nothing to say about it. I just wanted to mention it because a lot of people do care about it, and it seems to be an important part of the race. Um, but, you know, yeah, really don't even care about it or have anything to say. That's actually, uh, the last topic I really had planned on talking about. Um, you know, that's there really, like I said, not a lot happened this race that I felt was worth discussing. So that's pretty much going to do it for this episode. Um, next race. Um, should be kind of exciting just because of the setting. We're at Monaco next race, so that'll certainly be interesting if not for anything other than the location of the race. But uh, yeah, like I say, that's going to do it for this episode of the Pole Position Podcast. If you'd like more content, be sure to check out fpssquared.com. We've got not just Formula One content, but we've got gaming content and maybe a few other things are uh, in the works as well. But um Yeah, uh, that's going to do it, and we'll see you next race.